So we have some icons of sport. We want to end on a really uplifting um, note. After such an incredible few days, we've um, received a lot of information. And I think some of the most um, inspiring stories have been directly from the athletes. And we want to take a page from some of the legends of their sports and get some Q&A as well. So I just wanted to take a minute to introduce um, three of our icons. First up, Inga Thompson is zooming in. She's a, a cycling Olympian. She was a third place finisher in the Tour de France and a five-time national champion. Sue Walsh was swimming. Um, she's also an Olympian, a, an 11-time NCAA champion, and competed against the East Germans uh, back when, well, she'll tell you, tell us, well, she'll tell us of all about that. Um, and then finally, Ann Simpson, a rower, she was an NCAA athlete and one of the first female pilots, and tell me the airline again. On Northwest and Delta, and she's in the Museum of Flight, and also uh, did a recent TED talk on Title IX, which she's going to talk to us about as well. So, welcome. So, we have no pressure to make this uplifting after <laughs> Can you hear us, Inga? I can. OK, great. So first up, I just wanted to um, kind of go down the line and hear each of your individual stories about uh, sports and athletics in your youth and kind of um, your experience growing up as kids in sports. So why don't we start with Anne? Well, my youth was actually college. <laughs> I was a very athletic kid. I had um, very supportive fam uh, parents. I ski raced, rode horses, swam, water skied. And it was just, we would go out and play. And it gave me a background to be confident and know as a girl that I could do what I wanted to, which then, of course, became part of my profession that I could do that. So my um, story is a little bit different. I started swimming at the age of eight, and I think that was out of um, a necessity for my parents' mental health. I was the last of five children. I had a lot of energy that they didn't know what to do about. Um, so my first inclination was to be a gymnast, but as you can tell, I'm about 5'10", and I have no flexibility whatsoever, so that was kind of out. Um, so they then suggested that I join the local swim team. I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, and many of you who are familiar with swimming know that in most cases, especially warm climates, you have summer swim leagues. Well, in Buffalo, there's really only two sports to do in the winter, and they both involve water. One is hockey. Um, and the other is swimming. So we had a winter swim league, and they suggested that I try it for two weeks. Um, I was adamant about not doing so. I wanted to stay at home, and for those of you that are old enough, I wanted to watch Gilligan's Island and not be watching um, a black line on the bottom of the pool back and forth. But thankfully, my parents were much wiser than I. Um, they suggested, like a lot of things that they introduced us to, that I try it for two weeks. If I didn't like it, I didn't have to continue. Um, and darned it if I didn't like it. Um, and I enjoyed some success early on um, and um, continued, uh, obviously, even now as a 60-year-old, I continue to swim in the master's program. We're, Inga, we're just trying to get you on the, the screen so we could see you while you talk. So just give us just a couple seconds to get you on. Okay, great. Inga, tell us about yourself. So 
I started off, I think at about the age of eight, I was, uh, I was man of war. And, uh, and then after that, I identified as secretariat. Um, and then from there, I remember my mom telling me about, well, women can't. My, women, my mother started off um, as a skier and she could only do like the co-ed sports, but she couldn't actually compete. She was at Lewis and Clark. And I spent my childhood being told that I can't do sports. And then in 72, Title IX came around. And so I didn't, we didn't have scholarships available, but the sports were available. And so I went off to, and so through my high school career, you know, I got nine individual state championships in, uh, in cross country running and track and field. But more importantly, it was the young girls that I raced with, that it gave them opportunities. It gave them a feeling of accomplishment. I, I call it, we had this little ragtag group of gals, but the repercussions of that are long lasting to this day because all of these women, all of them are still, they're, they're icons in their own area. Maybe they didn't get to go on to Olympics like I did, but it was instrumental to have these young women because of Title IX be able to compete. And so then I go on, I go on a, a cross country scholarship at Cal Poly SLO and I became all American and I could not have had that without Title IX. And then I kind of graduate from there and I pick up a bicycle because I got injured and I get to be a three time Olympian and I get to win 10 national championships. And none of this would have been positive or possible without Title IX allowing me the very beginning of being able to compete in the very first place. And so this is why I have become so um, strongly involved in this movement was, you know, back in 2017, I'm like, oh, this must be fair because, you know, the IOC said that it was fair. And the science starts coming out. It's like, hey, this isn't so fair. In 2019, then we start listening to Lundberg and Hilton and, um, and Ross, and these people start speaking up. And when I started reading the science, it was like how unfair it is. But more, as importantly, when I was on the Oregon Bicycle Racing Association, strongly involved with Oregon and with cycling, um, we had like close to a 50% drop off of the women competing because they were so discouraged with men competing with the women that I was just watching women's athletics just fall away, just, just starting to disappear because it really wasn't worth the effort. And so this is when my activism became was in 2019 as I yet was another one of those Olympians that put forth a petition, got some incredible names to sign this that still to this day won't step up and actually say, hey, that's my name. Because and so mine, mine was put forth with all the names being secret because they could lose their jobs or the backlash. Um, but in order for us to have elite women at this level, we need the grassroots level. And so my activism has been at the IOC level and at the International Cycling Union level. And we have started a, a small group called Union Cycliste Feminine, and we're working with the Professional Cycling Association, uh, trying to, to change policy and this is why I'm so excited to be part of this group because we have put forth letters, we have put forth petitions, we have shown that 93% of the professional cycling women do not want transgender women in their sport. And all of this was ignored by the International Cycling Union. And what I'm finding is that in cycling, oh, I hate saying this, but it's especially misogynistic and or especially woke, but we're getting zero traction when we're putting forth the, the evidence. And so with Union Cycliste Feminine, our small group that we put together, we have Emma Hilton there, we have Kathy Devine. And these are fantastic minds with <coughs> five women who are Olympians from different continents. And, and we're not getting anywhere. And this is why I'm part of this group is like to, to join forces, to try to bring something together so that that cycling too can be one of those sports that will join on this bandwagon for fairness for women. Thank you, Inga. You, right, you jumped done. five <laughs> questions ahead of me. <laughs> but thank you, that was very insightful. So um, I wanna step back, um, rewind a little bit, and 
again, just go down the line and talk to each of you about um, people that inspired you as you were growing up in athletics. And Anne, you, you mentioned that it was a little bit later for you, but in childhood, is there, are, are there women in your life or men who, um, who you look to as role models who encouraged you to continue and pursue athletics? So let's start with Anne. Well, I can think of two. I'll start with my mom, who was also very athletic, and she used to tell the story that um, she got to play with football with the boys when she was growing up about 10 years old, and it was just great. And I was like, well, that's really cool. How come? She said, I was the only one with a football. <laughs> And then when I was in junior high, um, I had the opportunity to join a group of uh, one teacher. She was actually an English teacher in my junior high, and she put together a group of um, seven girls and eight boys, and we rode our bicycles. This is 1970 from Seattle to New York City. Um, I had a three-speed bike at the time, and my parents, you know, said, hey, if you earn enough money, you can have, we'll help you buy a 10-speed bicycle. So we rode, we all had 10-speed bicycles. We rode across the country. Our budget was $3 a day. Um, we put, we went to Army-Navy surplus, put saddlebags, and we carried everything, no swag wagon. And I think it was one, maybe one of the first times that I really thought, you know, I can do something like this. You know, I can do this. And in that case, I could keep up with the boys. Although we did have kind of gender stuff. The boys fixed the tires, and I don't know, we did something else, but. Me again, how old were you when you did that? 15. Oh, wow. Amazing. I seemed so, I felt so old, yeah. you know. <laughs> how about you, Sue? Well, now I feel like my story yeah. pales way in comparison to yours. Um, I think it would be two, I guess, groups of people. Um, again, I mentioned I started at the age of eight. Um, about the age of 12, my parents realized that I needed um, better training, um, competing with people at a higher level, so they moved me to um, a different club to swim year-round, not just in the winter. And that was a commitment on my entire family's part. My mom and dad had to drive us. Um, it was an hour away, um, and during the school year, we swam six days a week. In the summer, it was two times a day, six days per week. So they're driving back and forth. So I have to say that my parents really um, were a huge support for me, as well as my brothers and sisters. I mean, they had to do without mom and dad, or the focus was on my ability to train at that level in order to reach my dreams. Um, a couple of years later, I was fortunate to actually make the um, junior national qualifying time. And so we were swimming at junior nationals. I believe it was in Nashville, Tennessee. And um, before I went, I don't even know how this conversation came um, into being, but my brother was dating a, a girl at the time, and she had given him a stuffed dog that I really wanted. And so I kept asking my brother, can I have that? Can I have that? He was very... Um, reluctant to do so, probably because he feared getting into trouble from his girlfriend. But anyway, um, he said, I'll go ahead and give this to you if you can swim the 100 meter free in under 59 seconds. Well, at the time, my best time was um, not even a minute. And in the sport of swimming, a whole second is a lifetime. Um, but similar to Marshy, um, as she told us the other day, I really started to focus. I determined how fast I needed to be at each 25, how many strokes I needed to take. I can't tell you who I swam against. I can't tell you if there are other people in the pool. I was so focused on the minute that that gun went off, diving into the water and thinking about what my goal was. Um, and I want to ask all of you, what do you think my um, final time was? Anybody? Well, I would love that. Marcy, 58.99. So I still have that stuffed animal to, to this day. Um, and it's just a reminder of how powerful you can be when you put your mind into something and make a plan for what it's going to take to get there. At that same meet, um, it was around the same time of the 1976 Olympics. And as you recall, or hopefully recall yesterday, 
the East Germans had, the women had dominated and won either it was 10 of 11 or 11 of 12 individual events. And yet there was this final event, the women's four by 100 freestyle relay. And the East Germans were heavily favored, but our foursome was not going to be denied. I believe it was Jill Sterkel, Shirley Babishoff, Wendy Bolio, and Kim Payton, I think was the fourth. Um, and I, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it, but I remember watching that race, and I encourage all of you, if you have the chance to Google it and watch it, it it's so inspirational. Of course, they were just um, inducted into the um, uh, Olympic Hall of Fame. And when I watched them standing on the podium um, and listening to our national anthem being played, um, I thought to myself, that's what I want to do someday. And that set me on this path of um, determining what that was going to take. One other short story, and this will finish up. Um, so fast track two more years later, um, I was swimming in the senior national um, championships, which was also a qualifier for the US Swimming World Aquatics Championships in the Woodlands, Texas. And as I mentioned, I lived in Buffalo, um, five children. My dad was a teacher. My mom stayed at home to take care of all of us children. Um, helping us to become independent, strong um, individuals. So we didn't have a lot of resources. So instead of flying my dad, my mom, my coach and I to the woodlands, we drove. Now, it was not as far <laughs> as <laughs> cycling across the country, but it was a 1,500 mile trip. My dad figured out where we could stop along the way every single day for me to train. It took us three or four days to get there. and. I don't know how I did it other than the motivation was I am not taking that ride back. So I want to make this team so I can then go to Germany um, and then be flown back home after the competition. So I have to say a lot of that my motivation came from my family, the sacrifices that they made in order for me to be successful, as well as that 1976 Olympic team um, that really showed me that um, and, and we said this many times, that your mind can really make your body do things you never really thought it could. And Inga, how about you? Um, people that inspired and motivated you on your path, um, maybe before your giant victories through childhood and your teenage years? <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty simple in this area. Being told that I couldn't. Um, being told that girls couldn't, that we couldn't do that. And it just motivated me to, to drive me to do more. And, and I find it to be a resounding theme throughout my life because then when I came on and then I bought a cattle ranch and started ranching as a single woman being told I couldn't. And it was like, well, it's not rocket science. It's not that hard. Actually, this has been my reading material right before I uh, got on here was trying to fix my Ford tractor. Um, the hydraulics went out on it, <laughs> and, but women can, and I feel like being a part of telling women that, yes, you can, and anything that men can do, we can do, and right now having our rights rolled back, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm still gobsmacked that we're even having this conversation, um, but like I said, I'm simplistic in that way, is being told that, that I can't. And so in my running career, it was like, well, you know, women, you know, can't, and here comes Title IX, and then we can, and then with um, getting onto my bike, I was told that we can't, and well, heck, here comes the, uh, the 1984 Olympics for the very first time ever, and here comes Women's Tour de France, and I was told that, I, I remember watching this on TV, and I went down the bike shop, I'm like, I'm going to do the Women's Tour de France, and they told me, well, you can't. I'm like, yeah, but they have a women's tour de France. I didn't realize you had to be on a team, but I bought a bicycle. And from there, um, <coughs> started training and not, not started training. I'd already been a runner for 10 years. So that's not really fair. <coughs> but in three months later, I made an Olympic team. And then I had to make that decision between, do I go to the Olympics or do I do the women's tour de France? And, <coughs> and I ended up doing Okay, you're gonna have to go to somebody else because I got a tickle in my throat. <coughs> you finish um, your story on the next topic, so we'll we'll go to um, back to Anne. So, tell us about rowing because I 
personally know very little about it. Why, why did you choose rowing? How did you get into it? Um, we know you rowed at Cal. Tell us about your experience rowing at Cal. Well, first of all, I have to self-identify myself as a Title IX baby. Um, rowing would not have existed at Cal if it weren't for Title IX. Um, they were looking for, after Title IX passed, the requirements went out that you have to start equalizing things. And s rowing um, was, if you had a body of water anywhere near a university or public institution, it was a pretty fast way to ramp up a team with a lot of women. And you needed, all you needed were a couple of boats uh, that you'd take from the men's team and go out. Our <coughs> coach um, literally sta stood in the middle of Sproul Plaza because there were very few women who rowed at that time, you know, that came from a high school background rowing. They, we were all walk-ons on my team. And he would stand out in the middle of Sproul Plaza and literally look for the tall women. Sounds kind of creepy right now, but he'd look for the tall women walking by and he would go up to them and say, hey, would you like to try crew? And uh, some of our best rowers at that time were actually recruited that way. <laughs> I had, my dad had rowed, and so I knew a little bit about the sport. I'd done all um, uh, individual sports before that, and I thought this just sounded like a lot of fun to be suffering with other people in the boat with me. <laughs> and it was true. Um, Sue, you mentioned uh, the East Germans earlier. Uh, tell us about swimming um, during a time when, for example, the Olympics were boycotted and your experience with that and going through that. Sure. Uh, so I was, um, I guess, in my junior year of high school, and uh, my trajectory was going in the right direction to hopefully make the Olympic team, and so I doubled up on a lot of classes in high school so that I could graduate early and be able to focus on just training um, as a senior in high school. And as I mentioned, obviously the sport of swimming is, like many, it just requires a lot of time, dedication, grinding in day in, day out. Um, and so I guess it was around January, um, we heard from President Carter that the U.S. was going to boycott the Olympics because the uh, Soviets had invaded Afghanistan. And similar to the whole NCAA issue this past year, I kept thinking naively as a 17-year-old, well, certainly that's not really what's going to happen. You know, the um, USOC, which was the USOC at the time, um, is, is not going to go along with that decision, that somehow they're gonna send us, or maybe I can defect to Canada. Um, it, it just didn't seem that that was possible. Um, unfortunately, um, it became a reality. Um, another um, unfortunate situation was I also was diagnosed with mono about uh, two months out before Olympic trials, um, and I spent about two weeks in bed um, not being able to do anything, but I decided to use that time productively and start working on my um, visualization, my mental imagery, which is an important part of swimming in a lot of sports. Um, again, similar to what Marshy talked about, how many strokes does it take me to get from one end to the other? What are my splits gonna be? Who am I swimming against? And, and seeing myself winning against these people. And um, amazingly enough, it, it helped bridge that gap of not being in the water for that amount of time. Um, I did make the Olympic team, um, but of course we were not allowed to go, um, but we were able to compare our times um, to the rest of the world, and if I'm not mistaken, the East Germans won every single event at the 1980 Olympics, absent the U.S. and other uh, countries that had boycotted. Um, they won all gold medals. Um, I think there was, again, one more situation where maybe a Soviet won. But honestly, um, and this is to the point that we talked about that um, women who identify otherwise, even if they're on testosterone, really can't ever make up the fact that a male has been through puberty. And why I'm saying this is because the East Germans weren't um, significantly faster than 
where I was in terms of someone who was swimming clean. Um, but it was just frustrating to know that we didn't really have anyone advocating for us. Um, we didn't really feel like we had a voice or those that were advocating for us just weren't being heard by those people who could make the decisions to um, repair the situation. So it was a, a bit difficult. And um, again, moving forward a little bit, I um, actually was backwards. When I swam in that first world championships meet, I remember, um, again, I'm 16 years old. I'm in Germany. I don't know German. Um, I'm sure the coaches may have explained to us, Nancy, you may remember, which is women's bathroom, which is the men's bathroom, but I went into one that I thought was the women's, and I'm taking a shower, and I hear these really deep voices behind me, and I'm thinking, oh, gosh, I just walk into the men's restroom. You know, how do I get out of here without everybody noticing? And I kind of turned around, and I'm trying to back out and realize it's two of the, the East German women that were in there changing with me, and I'm like... You know, at 16 years old, I, have, I am naive and, and had no idea what was going on. Um, and to sit in what's called the ready room before your race, you're kind of put into this little corral of a room and you're having to face these other people. They have their goggles on, they have their sweatsuits zipped up, and I'm just intimidated to no end. And I'm, I'm just sitting there thinking, lost before the race has even begun. Um, and it just was really discouraging um, to know that no matter how hard I worked, I just wasn't going to be able to, to beat them. So, Inga, um, speaking of doping, uh, cycling has been in the news um, recently uh, quite a bit with... Um, hitting on this topic. And with experience in the Tour de France, I'm wondering um, what is the international community, the cycling community uh, uh, ver perspective on cycling as a sport versus the US? And then maybe your take on um, you know, something Sue touched on in terms of doping in the sport and your experience in the cycling world on this. Yeah, the, I think we've all followed the news with Lance Armstrong and doping in the sport. And it's kind of been one of the uh, talking points that I've used is, well, what's the problem with having one person doping in the sport? Or what is the problem with having one transgender woman in the sport? And it's because it takes away all the opportunities of everybody around you. And it's the reason why I quit, because the women that I were that I was beating I'm not going to say that I was beating them like hands down, but I was solidly beating them. And then when uh, when EPO came out and and then I couldn't touch these women. I just couldn't touch them. I went from beating them by, you know, five seconds to 30 seconds, depending on the length of the event, to, you know, losing by two or three minutes. And you only can do that for so many years before you just walk away. And then to complicate that, dealing with my federation at the height of uh, Lance Armstrong coming around was like, well, you're not a team player, and so you need to be a team player. Well, we all knew what that meant at that time. Being a team player meant that you took drugs. And they're like, you know, and then watching women that had tested positive for drugs become the coach's selection and, and to be put back on, and they're telling me that I'm not a team player. It's like, no, hold on. You know that I'm a team player as far as far as like team tactics that go on and stuff like that. And so it was that unwritten language of, you know what we mean, and you will never be um, on another Olympic team or a world team again, <clears throat> because I wouldn't do the tactics of the doping. And like I said, this was in the height of Lance Armstrong coming in in 93 and, be, and removed from a world's team, even though I was automatic qualifier, I was forcefully removed. And that was the era that I was competing in, where it went from being a level playing field to the drugs coming in. And so what I never got over, though, was competing against these women that I had solidly beaten and then spending several years of getting beaten by them. So I know that feeling of the discouragement when you know you know that you can't win. You can't beat that unfair advantage. And that's, you know, kind of one of the reasons I'm really speaking up here is 
I, I know what that'll do to the younger generation. They're like, why bother? Because we're all we're all competitive women. You can't sit here and look at this whole group and say, yeah, you know, I really like you, and I'm just going to hand that medal over to you, even though I know that you have an unfair advantage. It brings out the fight in all of us to want to have fairness. And I loved racing when it was called when it was when it was a fair fight. Those women that I was beating, I'd kick their ass one day, and they get kicked my ass the next day, and you just kind of did this back and forth, but it made it fun. I mean, isn't that the essence of sports is to lose, to win, to give it your best and lose, and then to give it your best and win. And that is being taken away from us and being asked to like, you know, it's, it's okay to settle for a second or it's okay to settle to be on the team. No, I'm competitive. That is not, that's, that's not okay with me. And I really want to make sure that this younger generation has these opportunities and even if that opportunity means that you get your ass kicked again and again and again, that's okay when you know that it's a fair fight. And so, you know, we, so I, I do, I kind of loop into this, the doping aspect versus a, having a transgender woman in our field. And, you know, following this for like the last five years, what I can tell you with this whole group, everybody here speaking, there is not a single transphobic person here, but what I see is a lot of women that are passionate about fairness in women's sports. That's what I see. And, um, and it's not okay to have one transgender woman in there as it was not okay to have Lance Armstrong in there dominating the field. And it was not okay to have the women in my field taking dopes, you know, doping, and annihilating the rest of us. It takes away from the whole point of competition, which is to have fairness and to have a fair fight. Thank you so much. I remember hearing um, Coach Persley tell me um, he drew the parallel between your experience um, in the Olympics uh, in, on the swimming side in this issue, and although it's not the same um, in any in many ways, just like you said, Inga, there are um, stark um, parallels. So thank you for that. So Anne, um, I wanted to jump ahead and talk talk to us about your career, uh, your success um, after athletics, and what you what the lessons learned in sports um, how that applied to your success then later on in life this is like my favorite question because i did not win any national championships i would have liked to have gone to the olympics but I was not that great an athlete i got to row in the varsity boat and i loved the team that i worked with but I was filling my little toolkit for the three years that I competed at Cal with all the things that we've been talking about here today, or the last couple of days. Uh, determination, hard work, um, leadership, um, losing so that next time you could win. All of these tools that um, I took into my profession and I was flying training and learning how to fly while I was training to row and um, when I graduated I had this very full bag of things that I could take I didn't get hired uh, by the first job interview but you know like athlete 101 is uh, if you don't succeed the first time what do you do you work harder, you practice more, you gain experience, and you try again. And you know what? Next time, at the ripe old age of 25 in 1981, I was hired by an airline. And then throughout my career, the next 35 years, I say this often, I did not, there was not one day when I didn't reach back into that toolkit and pull something out. Um, whether it was getting a little tiny bit more self-confident to tell that annoying co-pilot, remind him that actually I was the captain. Um, or at one point in my career, there was 
pornography in the cockpits when I started. And at one point, I had just had enough of it. This was my office space, and there was no reason that this should be there. I had to dig kind of deep to find the strength to stand up for myself and all 12 other women <laughs> in the airline that this wasn't right. And I took a lot of crap for it. And there was a lot of pushback, like, why are you invading our space? From a few people. Most of the guys were awesome. But because I had learned through sport and competition that I could handle this, it worked. So I, I say that second to my parents, competition, sport, made me who I was, 35 years of flying, and beyond that. Um, I am glad I did not have to deal with the issue that the young athletes are having to do deal with today. I honestly think I might have quit, and I don't know where I'd be without sport and competition. And Sue, how about you? How did you take your experience in swimming um, past um, your athletic career? I couldn't agree with Anne anymore in terms of the toolbox that you um, can build and fill based on your experiences as a collegiate athlete. And um, one of the things that I was really passionate about was the fact that it was only seven years after Title IX was passed that I was offered a full scholarship. Again, coming from a family where the resources were not plenty, um, that meant a whole lot to my family. My four brothers and sisters all went to an in-state um, local school. They didn't have the opportunity to um, really expand their horizons and go someplace else. So I was so thankful for that, and I wanted to pay them back by um, providing those same opportunities to other, especially women. So I went into um, athletic fundraising. I was a, a fundraiser for over 31 years. I primarily raised money for scholarships. Um, and just before I retired, I launched a new women's initiative at the University of North Carolina. You saw the t-shirt I had on yesterday. Uh, Forever Tar Heels, where we um, champion and empower our women student athletes. Um, we have a mentoring program. Um, just before COVID hit, we were in the process of trying to set up a career networking platform. And I just wanted everyone to have those same opportunities, and it's, it's really discouraging to see that potentially be taken away. I'm, I just think the lessons that we learn put us on such a positive trajectory, and as Donna um, DeVerona had said the other day, and this was something that I keep in my mind, that 94% of women in C-suite positions played a sport at some point in high school or college. So those lessons truly do carry on and impact our ability to succeed in whatever profession we, achieve, we choose. We had women who were Navy pilots um, from the University of North Carolina who were neurosurgeons, who are um, uh, conference commissioners, um, other physicians. It, it's just amazing the things that our women are doing, and a lot of that is due to the fact that they've, they've really gained that confidence um, an ability to really um, do the things necessary to reach their potential. And how about you, Inga? Same question. Past your or your athletic career, um, how have you taken the lessons learned into the next phases of your life? Was that for me? Ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, had so many different answers to this one. I ended up buying a cattle ranch and and had to become resourceful as far as multitasking. I had to learn about cattle. I had to learn about the ranch. I had to learn about equipment. I had to learn about land. I had to learn about irrigation. And then I also had to kind of incorporate myself into, you know, as a liberal Democrat, I got wrapped into this, you know, patriarchal, Republican hardcore society. And here I am, a, a single woman, raising a child, running a ranch. But it gave me, the sports gave me the solid bearing of, I knew that I could. And I knew that I could, yeah, I just knew that I could. We're not talking rocket science here. I just have to, you know, buckle down and to study and to, and, and, and to try. 
And we knew how to do that with sports because, you know, in, in my era, in, for a lot of these women eras, eras, it was being told why you couldn't, why you weren't good enough, why just why women couldn't. That's all I ever really heard. And I, I really wanted to be a role model here to young women. It's like, if I can, you can, you know, and so we threw hay bales and we fixed fence, but I don't think I could have done that without what the sports gave me about pushing back against all of the, the messages that we heard that you couldn't. And then as I grew, all the messages we heard that, that we could. And I don't think enough of our young girls are hearing that. Even here in the ranching community, I spent a lot of time with these young girls telling them why they can't. And, and when I look at what cycling has done for me as far as just the hard work, the never say die attitude, pushing through it, like, you know, on the ranch, there's, there's a lot of physical work, you know, as well. Like when we're throwing those, you know, little 65 pound hay bales with the boys. And I always love that. You know, a lot of the boys are like, telling my son, your mom is throwing hay bales with us. And, you know, these little, these young men would slow down and be like, hey, I'm the only one here with mammary glands. Come on, you guys, you know, pick it up. And, and it's really fun to watch these young boys see that women can. And I don't know if I could have done that without sports. It's, it's important for our young, like, like we always put this emphasis on Olympics and world championships, but I always like rolling it back and putting emphasis on what high school sports did for me and what college sports did for me. And I, and, and I, I, I do, I circle back around to the young women that I competed with in high school and I competed with in college and seeing the success in their careers when they shouldn't necessarily have been as successful. Cause I know a lot of them came out of, you know, very patriarchal religious societies where they really need to behave and get married and start having children. And I watched a lot of these young women claim themselves because of sports. And so you'll hear me talk about, yes, we have a leak, but we have to come back to our grassroots to develop our elite. But, but even beyond that, our grassroots develop these young women to go on in life and be successful. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I have one last question for everyone. Um, you know, we're winding down the end of two and a half amazing days um, with so many wonderful people that I've been able to meet um, from all over the world that have come together. So to you, what do you think we as a group can do for the future of women's sports together? Well, I want to thank both Kim and Marshy, you two, because I think this is the start. I mean, I had been looking for some place like this for two years and I know we've been talking about it for the last couple of days. I think this is the beginning of a great big snowball. And I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna be braver, I'm going to be stronger. Um, as Fiona was saying, I'm not just gonna sit in the background um, with the pornography in the cockpit. Somebody had to stand up and say, you know what, that's not right. And I'm gonna start doing that. So that's what I'm taking away. Starting with my 37-year-old daughter who does not agree with me. Again, like everyone else, I wanted to thank Kim and Marshy. Um, I, I'm absolutely stunned that they could pull us all together in so short of a time. I do hope you get some rest tonight and then tomorrow be right back <laughs> at it. Um, I think that my takeaway in particular um, is listening to Lily and realizing that we have to speak for others who can't, who are afraid or are not in the position to do so. And um, I now feel much more well-educated. I'm armed with information that can help me have those conversations. And um, the one thing I want to ask of everyone here is that 
when I started our uh, women's initiative at Chapel Hill, I told them I didn't want it to be just a campaign fad, that once our university campaign was done, everybody went about their business and we just kind of let it go by the wayside. This is too important. There's been too much already invested in icons and we need to make sure that we keep it um, moving forward, um, producing results, and being the voice for our, our female student athletes because they deserve it and um, it really benefits society if our women continue to have these opportunities and are um, supported by a very strong backbone. And Inga? Yeah, we need an organization like this coming together because I put together a small one for uh, Union Cycliste Feminine and we didn't have the power to to enact any change and even when we had the professional cycling association step up they were ignored and i work with them and i ha have north american cycling professionally associate uh association and we were ignored and and then you go to some of these other women's groups that i feel like kind of sold us out and it's like so we need something like this coming together um those of us that are willing to step outside of the politically correct arena and to do what is fair for women. And it's organizations like these. And, you know, I actually believe that this transgender movement has been, it's gonna sound really odd, but good for women because we have always taken the back seat and taken the back seat and kind of pushed forward. We're trying to get equality. We're trying to get equal pay. We're trying to get equal, you know, media coverage. and we, get it at this like snail's pace, pace, and then here comes men into our sport. And you just see this total implosion, and I, and I call it this total sellout. Well, in the process, last few years, organizations like these are coming together that are actually going to put women first, where before the organizations were there, seemed like they were more focused in on, we just kind of want to be part of the crowd, and so we're going to tell the men, yeah, we'll do whatever you tell us to do, but we're going to be the women's sports, whatever, fill in afterwards. And so the good that I see coming out of this is that women are organizing and we are coming together. And I think we're going to see huge changes out of this because we're not just trying to get into the, the patriarchal crowd of you know, can I fight for a few rights? I mean, I've been fighting for women's sports for so long and have kind of got nowhere. I mean, like in 1990, I remember fighting for, yes, we should be able to race our bike when we're menstruating. And am I really having this conversation? And I had to fight for like a year to make sure that we could race our bikes while we're menstruating. And, and so, you know, so here we are 30 years later, trying to fight for women's sports again. And it's just, just been this knocking our head against the wall thing. And so I see things, I see a lot of good coming out of this. And yes, we are still in the grassroots. We are still 10 years behind, but I see some good changes going on here. And, and, and I hope we keep the ball rolling on this one that we just don't, you know, once we get claim the women's sports back, that we keep rolling forward from there as far as media, as far as coverage, as far as salary and pay. And this is the vision that I see, the long-term vision, is that this has brought us all together. And I'm kind of thankful for it in hindsight. Um, <laughs> I didn't like all the beating that I took, but I'm glad to see this happening. Well, we're glad to have you, and thank you all um, so much for sharing your insights. It's um, so powerful to hear directly from um, women in, in sports, and we learn so much.